when I was talking about sisters organizing and I met, uh, I talked about Gloria Richardson. She was in Cambridge, Maryland back in the late 60s. Uh, here in Baltimore City, we have a Gloria Richardson also. And that's Tawanda Jones. She's been fighting. She's been fighting for her brother's justice, Tyrone West, for four years. Having missed the beat, having slowed down, her life's been threatened, her job's been threatened, and she continues to fight every week. West Wednesdays happen somewhere here in Baltimore. So, out of the honor of that struggle, I'm gonna give her the opportunity to ask the first question. Tawanda. Um, can you, can y'all hear, oh, hear me? Um, first of all, I wanna give thanks and honor for just being here. And I'm most gracious for the words that you just blessed me with just now. And all I keep on hearing, so I really don't have a question. I just wanna let you know, I'm keep on going. I've been moving ever since they murdered my brother on July the 18th. For now, for 245 weeks, 1,715 days, fighting nonstop for accountability. Nonstop. We just left West Wednesday, which was held at City Hall, and we took it to where the mayor and where the state's attorney and where all the jokes and the folks were. It was our obligation, it's our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We have nothing to lose but our chains. So I'm just gonna keep on fighting and I'm gonna keep it moving. I'm never gonna stop and I feel like there is no justice. It's just us holding folks accountable. And just like Dr. King said, an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. And right now it's a worldwide thing and it just needs to stop. So I'm never gonna stop until killer cops are in cell blocks. I respect officers like your son, like you worry about your child coming home to you. A good officer, that's why I call out killer cops. I don't put them all in one box because they're not. But at the same time, we see a bunch of snakes coming down the street. I'm not gonna stand there and watch and figure out who's poisonous and which one's not. I'm going to keep it moving. So thank y'all. We more than hashtags and body bags. We more than being six feet in the dirt and pictures and buttons on T-shirt. Our lives matter. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, is there any questions in the audience for uh, Danny, for uh, Senator Turner? Uh, yeah, I have the mic. Oh, uh, okay, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Hi, thank you, I'm Nikichi Taifa. And um, I'm sorry, um, Brother Eddie, I, I got here late and didn't uh, hear part of your presentation. But first of all, thank you everyone. You know, I felt like I was in church. I mean, you know, um, you know just really fired up. But you know, um, Eddie, you were a victim of the COINTELPRO, the FBI's one secret legal um, campaign to destroy the movement. Martin Luther King was a victim of the COINTELPRO. If COINTELPRO had been in Brazil, Mario Franco would have been a victim um, of the COINTELPRO. So guys, my question is, in today's BIE, Black Identity Extremist, the new label that the FBI has put on our leaders, just what is it that we can do to ensure that what happened in the past is not repeated today. And that folk today know, in fact, what happened in the past, which caused people like you to serve over, you know, 40 years unjustly, you know, in prison. So that's my question. So the Quintelpo, illegal abuses by government against people who are talking about everything Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about and more. Yeah, and, and all I would say, um is that we have to organize, 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 uh, and educate. There's already been people locked up that hadn't broken any laws, uh, but have been identified as black identity extremists. 
Uh, in Texas already, there's people facing 10 years for that, for having a mindset. Uh, and that's an immediate threat to organizers and activists throughout the black community. But the National Defense Authorization Act is an immediate threat to every citizen in the United States of America uh, because it gives the president or his designee the power to lock up anybody, anytime that they declare that this person is the enemy of the state. That's what that, that whole terrorist campaign that started after 2001 has led to now. The COINTELPRO of yesterday that was illegal is now legal today for not only blacks, but everybody in this audience right now. And so you gotta organize, you gotta organize and organize and build. Is there another question? Good Go ahead. Um, peace and blessings, I'm Taliba Yvette Macon. What I really want to ask is a ground level question. I love my people, I love my community but we seem to be killing as many of each other as everybody else. What do we need to do or to stop it? Okay, like, you know, if, 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 um, if there are gang members and there are children, what do we do to go get them? Or some of them, everybody's not gonna come, but they're our future and they matter. They matter greatly to me. And we talk about police killing us. But when I'm walking down the street and I love brothers and I see some, somebody's children coming and I feel fear, something is wrong with that. So beyond the world, right in our world, in this community, we need to save our people, our children, our brothers, their mothers. And I've even worked on programs um, that were just programs because they really didn't meet the need of the family. When I talk to people, everybody says, I'm going to help the youth. I'm going to help the children. But aren't we all the children of God? So if you don't start with their families, then you're really not helping the youth because we need strong families in Baltimore. That's how I'm feeling today. Anybody? You know, as, as I listen to the question, um, I, I also thought about uh, the extraordinary opportunities that happen in communities every day, places like Detroit, places like Minneapolis, places like Chicago, where young men and young women are recalibrating what is happening in their communities, whether it's through the activities of urban gardening, whether it's through the activities of, 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 of organizations that are, uh, that are uh, peace zones within the community. All those things, of the, the emerging of, I think, a new, a new dialogue and a new narrative that happened in our community. How we nurture those things is, uh, is, is very important. So, certainly, and we don't know what the outcome is. You know, I, I think at the same time that you justifiably are right in the fear that you have just expressed, it's, we all do that. But we have to find ways in which I think we find those avenues in which we can intersect, engage, and as, as, as Eddie keeps saying, organize and organize. And when we see this happening, we know that it is women who are the, in the leadership and acknowledge that, that as well. One of the things that I do, sister, and I've been doing this now for about three years, is that every morning, I go to the corner store to get me some coffee. It's really not about that cup of coffee, but that's where the youngest are hanging at, right? And so, and so I first start going down there and I speak love into them. And I speak, and I speak peace. How y'all doing today? You know, what y'all got up for today? Is everything all right? How you feel? And then at some point they begin to trust me. And then I start talking about things that matter to them. Well, you know, uh, I just heard that you could get your record expended. Oh, I can, where can I do it? I'm gonna bring you some information tomorrow. You meet me up here at the same time. And I start speaking love and information to them. And now they call me Ma and they listen to me. And then I bring up, I bring up 
things that I read about that's going on in the community, and I ask them, now, now how would you deal with that? Would you, you know, we can't all take out our pistol, even though we feel like it, you know, but we can't do that. How, how are we going to handle this? And then I, then I tell them the things that as wisdom that I gathered as being my 60-some years old, when I wasn't always, I didn't have wisdom because I grew up in the street. So bottom line is, I, I, I was afraid at first. I'm not going to lie to you. But God told me to get up in the morning because they be down there at 7 or 7.30 and stay down there until like you going to get your cup of coffee and speak to speak love and speak safety over to these youngsters. And that's the way I do it. And now I don't have no fear. I don't have no fear. And, and, I, and I watch them and I tell them stuff like, man, you know, you done grow since last summer. They, that mean they, I'm watching, I say, you must have grown about five inches. And that, they know I'm showing love to them. So we can't fear our children. I know, I understand what you're saying, but you have to just take God with you, and you have to say one on one. One, talk to one. Then he said, what's she talking to that lady about? And then he'll come listen, because he want to know. Then another one will come listen, because they want to know. Next thing you know, they can't wait till I get down there in the morning to open the door for me. That's mom. So that's the way you do it. that wants to run independently because so many of us, me included, are unhappy with the Democratic Party. It's become a corporate party, and you don't know where Republicans end and Democrats begin, but they ha and you're talking about um, collusion. I think when you have superdelegates, that's collusion, and they're not getting uh, proper representation. So I ask this to anybody on the panel, how can we ease the, uh, the two-party system, and how can we get rid of superdelegates within the Democrat Party? Well, thank you so much for that question. Um, first of all, there was a unity reform commission that was formed from the 2016 campaign, an agreement between Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton's two campaigns. Uh, we met for almost a year. I was on that unity reform commission, and certainly the Bernie Eight, as we're called, because there were eight of us that were appointed by Senator Sanders, uh, we were nowhere near the majority, we were outnumbered, but we did come to some consensus. Now written within that re resolution was the automatic reduction of superdelegates by about 60%. Even though the Bernie 8 wanted all of the superdelegates gone, just all of them, because it is unfair to have superdelegates put their bodies and thumbs on the scale before the nominee is even, that happened in 2016. And it don't matter who you were for, Fairness is fairness, and it, it is an unfair system, and I'm here to tell you that the system is rigged. It is real. Not just that system, but the system is rigged. But one of the things that can be done, the Democratic Party has, well, when they have their summer meeting, they're going to be taking up the recommendations of the Unity Reform Commission. And people who care about whether or not this party transforms itself, should get engaged. And so I want to invite you to go to ourrevolution.com. You can read the Unity Reform Commission's report, and hopefully we can get them to, to do away with all of the superdelegates, every single one of them moving forward. But you have an opportunity. Send an email or call Chairman Perez and, and make it known what kind of party that you want to see. In terms of the two-party system, they're corporations. I want folks to know these are private entities. I hope we understand this. They get to make the rules that all of us have to play by. So it is hard in this country. In other countries, they have more than two parties. But in this country, we have two parties. So we have a decision to make. There will be some of us who will work within that party to try to change it. And there are going to be some folks who are going to work outside to bring the pressure on the inside. We need both of those things. But if progressive-minded folks, and that doesn't mean that we always have to agree, but progressive-minded folks who want to work to not just transform that party, but to take over that party. So when folks say to, to me, somebody like me, if you don't like it, leave, I'm not leaving, you leave. <laughs> you leave. 
You know, that's no different than some, you know, racist folks telling black folks to lead the country. You know, and to have some Democrats who are the corporatist Democrats say the progressive Democrats leave the party is a slap in the face. Now, we got we to gotta either straighten out this party, and if it can't be straightened out, then we got to take some other course of action. But what we're not going to do is continue business as usual. So please, sisters and brothers, write Chairman Perez. Look up and find out who is your representative on the DNC, because we will be voting in the fall, summer to fall, about whether or not those superdelegates should still exist. If you put some pressure on them, that kind of pressure that Reverend Dr. Luther King was talking about, put the pressure on them, then we will see the change. And if they're unwilling to change or move, then maybe we need to change and move. OK. Got, got, time, got time for one last question. About, they talked about capitalism as a system, a vicious system. Leadership in this country, black leadership, I'm sorry, black leadership doesn't speak to that issue. And, and everything that's vicious in terms of poverty, criminalization, you know, black folks being messed over, you know, and people of color, it's capitalism. Let's be clear about that. So when you talk about a third party, that third party has to represent something different. And if you're not representing something different, you can't buy into the same old stuff. The Democratic Party has been there. You talked about it yourself. And Donnie, I, 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 I totally appreciate your work, your body of work. But African people all over the world are suffering and people of color because of capitalism. That's what Vietnam was about. King couldn't say it in 67, 68 because he would have been called a communist or a socialist. But it was clear what he was saying. So how do you address that? Because I don't hear it being addressed on, at this particular group because our leadership has to be clear about where we're going, how to get there, and creating something different. Even in Baltimore, we had a black political party called Ujima that ran in the 7th District. It was not successful, but it was a beginning, you know, a, 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 on a local level. So we need to do something about that. Barry Sanders himself declared himself a Democrat, even though throughout the whole process, when he was asked, what am I? I'm a Democrat. That doesn't work. Anyway, that's, that's, that's part of my question to you, as well as a, a semi-statement. Well, I don't want to monopolize all this. I mean, people can define and declare themselves. You're addressing it. So all of us can't address the same things. It's the differences that make the whole. Uh, the senator said he was a democratic socialist. In other words, we know what pure communism is, is that you know, the government controls the flow of all goods and services. We're going to never be that in this country because that's not who we are. But your point about understanding how this system itself suffocates folks and what are we going to do collectively to address it? That means that we have to have people like you who speak up and speak out about it, and you can't be the only ones doing it. And we also are going to have to take the risk to say that if the system does not change, that we're going to change and that we're going to move. But we can't expect, this is not just about who the elected leaders are, this is about who we are. Because they only going to do what we allow them to do. And so I want to give one good example about what just happened recently with the the, the, the bill that just pa passed the Senate to lessen the regulations on big banks, because this is something, I think this is a good example of what you, now this just happened, just happened. I ain't talking about 10 years ago. I'm not talking about two years ago. I'm talking about almost two weeks ago. And you had 14 Democratic senators who voted for a bill to allow big banks to take even more risks, those same risks that took us under, almost took us under in 2008 when we had to bail them out. And also written in this bill is their ability to red line in black and brown communities. 14 Democrats gave them that vote. So to your point, and then those very banks that benefited from that bill turned around and wrote Republicans and Democrats a thank you letter for the giveaway. And one of those senators was Senator Doug Jones of Alabama. Now, the reason why I bring him up in particular is because the last time I heard that 98% of black women, 93% of black men put him over the top in Alabama, and he didn't hesitate to vote for a bill that he knew would harm black communities, poor communities. 
And why was he able to do that? Because he has no fear that the black community in particular, not exclusively, because over 90% of us sight unseen, sisters and brothers, do you understand what I'm saying to you? Sight unseen, they don't have to do anything for us. They know, they can predict that the black community is the only community that votes without making a demand of the Democratic Party. They can guarantee that over 90% of our vote will go to them and there's no consequence to that. So to, to our brother's point, everybody has to take up the mantle that matters to them. For some, it's the environment. For some, it's income and wealth inequality. For some, it's talking about the, the, the harm of a capitalist system that does not have humanity in it. And some people will argue that there will never be humanity in capitalism. I'm not necessarily going to go that far, but some of us need to take up our crosses and our mantles and we make the whole and all of us will cover the whole thing. But we have to make a demand of these folks and stop letting them fear monger us to vote for them because the next person is gonna be worse. You know, I had one of my mentors, her name was Councilwoman Fannie M. Lewis and she used to always say this, it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if you meant to kill me on accident or on purpose, dead is dead. <laughs> and that is our message to the Democratic Party. And so we got to demand more as a people. Every other ethnic group don't just give their votes away like we do, but we do. And what do we get for it generationally? I'm not talking about individual positions. Do you know in the history of this country, there's never been an African-American woman elected to serve as governor in the United States of America, yet we just give away our votes. And what about our white allies? Because we can't do this by ourselves. What about our brown, red, and yellow allies? If people of good consciousness, regardless of their ethnicity, unite, there is nothing that we cannot do. And so all of us are obligated to call out injustices. There's only been five black men elected in the history of this country. We got, one, we got Ben Jealous running right now in Maryland. So the question becomes, what are we going to do to hold elected officials accountable when they are not doing right by the people? And then don't even get me started on our Native American sisters and brothers who are just, we don't even talk about them. So we, 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 the collective we, we have to change this system and we can't be afraid to do it. And that really was what Dr. King's message was to, that particular speech, the question becomes, what are we going to put on the line? And what demands are we going to make? And when are we going to call out people when they are wrong? This is not about political affiliation. This is about your affiliation to humanity. And people want to ask me, are you a de Democrat? I'm a hell-raising humanitarian. That's what I am. I mean, as we take this moment 50 years ago and we translate this moment to where the country was 50 years ago, and many things that Eddie and I remember, whether it was students in 1968 in Paris were out on strike, students in, in, at Columbia University were out on strike, Students in San Francisco State were out on strikes. We had the massacre of students in Mexico City during the Olympics. Let's understand that clearly that period of time represented a period of time where there was a vicious effort to erase a generation of thinkers who had other ideas about the possibility of what kind of system we can build. The issue around systems of what are the relationships. Julius Neri in African Socialism talked about the systems of relationships, those systems of relationships of cooperation as opposed to systems of relationship of competition. And that all of the human activity in human development have gone further, further, have gone further by the relationship that we've born, is born out of cooperation. 
And I think we understand that clearly. We understand that as part of our internal orientation the moment we come in. It becomes corporation in that sense. From that sense, for the day that we come on this planet, it takes cooperation to get you to walk and talk. It takes cooperation to have you grow from childhood from, to adolescence to adulthood. It takes cooperation. What is the system of cooperation that we're going to develop beyond humanity or across humanity, rather? And I think the question becomes whether it looks something like we don't believe in, something that we've been told not to believe in, whether it's socialism, communism. The AMA, the time, the time that Medicare was passed, fought it the whole part of the first 20th century. Why? Because it looked like socialism. It looked like communism. Understand the terminology. All the reasons why this country does not have a universal health care plan like every other modern country in the planet is because it looks like communism or it looks like socialism. Let's throw away the terms and talk about what are the relationships that have evolved. And those relationships that have evolved have come, that we exist in now, it's come from, as Dr. Dr. James Lawson said, Reverend James Lawson said just the other day, plantation capitalism. Understand that term, plantation capitalism. What do we see now? The wealth, the prosperity, everything that's happening. King realized that. He realized it was based upon plantation capitalism that marginalized, that disenfranchised those people who were valuable in building the wealth in this country, but also marginalized poor whites as well. Understand that. And if whatever systems that arrive out of it, just like the system of capitalism came out of various forces, various political forces, various various forces in terms of the evolution of technology and the relationship that man has with nature, it did came out of that. What are the systems in our new configuration of who we need to be and what we need to do in being the human beings? What are the systems that we evolve? We may want to call it something else. It may evolve into something. That, it may emerge into something. But unless we understand that and have the vision and imagination to fall forth force for that, we'll sit here discussing whether it's communism or capitalism or the virtues of capitalism or the virtues of, of socialism and everything. What is that system? And how does that system in its dynamics, in its, in its own internal contradictions, force us a push us to grow and evolve and change and continue and understanding those dialectics are changing generationally. Those dialectics are always changing. Those contradictions are always changing. They're never the same. But we have to make a commitment to that transformation where it's perpetual, sustainable activism that will create the systems that we need, the systems that we will embrace as human beings and elevate our humanity. And Bill, what this young, this, this young preacher was talking about, he's young, 39 years old, this young preacher about, was talking about building that beloved community. Yeah. What does that public community look like? How does it feel? How does it talk about how we share? How does it talk about well, how we live in the city? James Lee, Lee Boggs. Married to Grace Ball said, we're going to be an organizer out of Alabama, auto workers, radical organizers out of there, talking about we're going to live in cities. If we're going to live in cities as we recognize over the 20th century that the majority of human beings live in cities, what does those cities look like? What are the relationships? How do we now take those relationships, those past relationships, have us just alienated from us from the land, have alienated us from each other? How do we take those systems now? Those systems, new systems that we evolve into, we grow into, we fight for, and we, we, we say, keep going for, keep going for. How do we take those systems that, that make us and transform our humanity and relationship to each other, relationship to, to ourselves, relationship to the rest of the planet, even the Mother Earth? Those are the systems. When the Native people, First Nation people, talked about what does, this, what does this earth look like seven generations from now? They weren't talking about communism or socialism. All they knew that there was a relationship that they had with the land. When native people in the 11th century, 
Native people in the 11th century called a, 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 a conference in the Americas, right here in 11th century, long before Columbus, and talked about how to, what are the relationships are we going to have between us? What are the tribal relationships? How are we going to protect and, and nurture the young? I mean, there were conflicts within that context. Yes, there were conflicts, but they were finding ways of resolving those conflicts. It was based upon cooperation, cooperation with each other, cooperation with this incredible, fragile, beautiful planet that we live on, but it moved towards something higher and keep reaching for something higher. So those are the ideas that we have to say. This is the ideas that King left us with. This is what he left us with. This incredible possibility, the possibility not the dream, the possibility of who we can be. That's what it is, the possibility of what we can do. He was, he was very clear about who we are and rather ever and what we can, what we have the, what we can do, but he knew that we can go further than that as human beings. And that's where we're at right now. And we have to take all of this, take every single, everything that my sister here has talked about, whether it's universal health care, whether it's, whether it's the rights of women and the frog for women, whether it's the, 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 eyes, the idea of being full citizens in, this, in a democracy, in a participatory, participatory democracy, not a democracy that is governed by simply who we elected, but we hold the politicians accountable and we down there and we everyday activism, everyday fighting for the, that, that, that voice, our voice and everything. What does it take to create that? and dissemble that. And who knows what would happen if we do that? Who may know what would happen? Every one of us could be in jail because we try to do that. Because <laughs> we know what is happening to the whole sake of participatory democracies in other places in the world where people really become active, really become citizens, and understand the, the role that they play as ordinary people, ordinary citizens. Where do we take that on? And where it be, this comes sustainable. What is, in Grace Lee Boggs' last, last book, the next revolution is evolution.